Long days, pleasant nights, and welcome to Kingslingers, a doof media podcast journeying through Stephen King's Dark Tower series and beyond. I am your host, constant reader Scott Daly, and I'm joined, as always, by Castle Rock, Colorado's third best cribbage player, Matt Freeman. How's it going today, Matt? That's right. Uh, the The tournament uh, was uh, this weekend, and um, I definitely know how to play cribbage. Collected the bronze. Everyone loves the bronze winner. They always remember them. Mm-hmm. Just so we're clear, I literally don't know how to play cribbage. I, I, I there are cards, I believe. Um, is is it is it like a board game? There are cards. Oh, so like Magic the <laughs> Gathering, then? No, no, like oh. playing cards. Oh, okay. I think there's also like a board thing, but I think that's for keeping score. I don't know. It doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm not smart enough for games like this. Anyway. <laughs> this week, our series examining Stephen King's 112263 continues with part four, covering chapters nine through 11 of the novel. Jake heads back to Derry where he places some bets and then murders some guys. Uh, and then uh, before quickly helping out, um, a, a poor wheelchair bound woman heads down south to begin the, the rest of our novel. <laughs> Matt, what did you think of this week's reading? Very fun. Um, a lot of satisfaction, a lot of, you know, stuff that we've been building up toward for mm-hmm. essentially the whole book so far um, yeah. is is resolved. I, I, I kind of, you know, a, a book this big, sometimes you can think of them as uh, episodic almost. Like, sure. It, yeah. I, I, some, I sometimes feel like any sufficiently large book becomes episodic. Like almost by a bit by it. Like, like it has to yeah like by, by like, like structurally you would become exhausted if it wasn't and so yeah we've sort <laughs> of we've i mean not that not that there's no returning to the elements from this part of the story but like we've we've completed the assassinate um the target mission and mm-hmm. um, and now we're kind of moving on to the next thing so yeah 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 it, it's once again i i pat myself on the back for expertly accidentally ending are reading right where I think the perfect place to end it would have been, <laughs> which is he wraps everything up uh, up north and then and then heads heads to the south. I didn't do that on purpose. It's just kind of the way the the pages land. Or or should I say should I just edit that out of the podcast and say this is all part of my plan? Yeah, yeah. You you plan it all out all like back in <laughs> 2020 or whatever. Yep. Yep. To the day. Oh. I'm amazing. I'm so good yeah. at this. It's wild. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I enjoyed this week's reading as well. Um, I'm I'm really loving this book. I don't think we've like, you know, we tend to get get into the the, the weeds here. I don't think we've yet to kind of take a step back and be like, hey, are you like, do you like this book? <laughs> like, are you is this a good book that you're enjoying? Uh, definitely. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm enjoying the point of view. I'm enjoying what we're kind of exploring. You know the the. Uh, very fresh feeling take on a time travel story Mm -hmm. um and uh just it's a very well realized story like it's easy to take that for granted when you've done the 15th stephen king book in a row (laughs) um but uh sometimes it pays to just stand back and be like this is a very engrossing well written just uh, vivid, like a live story where, yeah. where you, you just, you just get sucked into it very easily and it feels very real. Um, which is not, which is not true of all books, but by any means. So. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I, I think this is, this is, it's a lot of fun. It's emotional. It's, it's deep. I think there's a lot going on here that we're kind of hinting at and talking about as we go through it. Um, but, but also just the characters are really engaging. Like I, we haven't like specifically talked about Jake broadly in, in a bit since we met him, but I really like him. I really like it, how complicated he is. I really like his clear addiction to this time period and, and how that's driving the narrative forward. Um, and, and kind of getting to wonder well, what, how is that going to pay off? What's going to happen there? How, how is this going to affect the mission he's set himself on for the next five years? Um, it's just, yeah, er- everything's clicking for me in, in every word we read so far. I like that you said addiction because that was a word that I used to describe his attitude, which, which I felt a little conflicted about even as I wrote it because I was like, is it really an addiction? But I, I guess the reason I bring that up here is is one interesting thing about Jake as a protagonist is he, he doesn't have an obvious flaw, like he doesn't have a glaring flaw, especially yeah. compared to a lot of King protagonists where they just have 
an absolutely glaring flaw <laughs> that that you're you know right in your face like severe alcoholism or something often sure. but um jake i think he does have a flaw and i think it's sort of gr- more slow played revealing of of what that and it's a i honestly think it's a more relatable subtle flaw it's the sort of flaw we all kind of have where you know I don't know. I don't. I don't know if I can quite put my finger on it yet, actually. But I'm beginning to see the shape of what we're doing with this character. Um, sure. I, yeah. No, I, I'm happy. I agree with that. Um, it, uh, yeah. He he's not simple and obviously flawed, but there are there is there is there are things there for sure. I agree. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, let's get into our chapters, Matt. Let's do it. Um, I think I think the I guess the thing we should say at the beginning is we have entered a new part of the novel. This novel is divided into parts like so many King novels before it are. Uh, and as I as I mentioned to you last week, this is part three living in the past, um, which is a pretty, pretty good indicator of of what portion of the, the story we're going to be entering into now. Um, we're going to be the one where where he lives in the past, <laughs> at least for a while. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we begin chapter nine. This chapter begins with Jake returning from the 50s to Al Diner and and to Al himself uh, smoking a cigarette, Matt. This is the thing that is is uh, the first thing Jake sees upon walking up the steps is Al with a cigarette. And uh, and he's kind of beside himself that a man like immediately dying of lung cancer would be still smoking. Um, but I like this, Matt, as I think this is like, in my opinion, knowing what we know that about what Al is going to do here in this chapter, like he, he knows that he's about to die and he's probably been planning the suicide that he commits here. I mean, definitely over the last two minutes, he's been tossing it like Jake. He's like, Jake's going to come back. I'm gonna, he's going to have proven to himself that it's right. Um, and then yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to let him go and I'm going to go. Um, but maybe, I mean, maybe he's been planning this for, for a while now we don't know but i think that's just the cigarette in retrospect is a great indication of of what al's mindset is at this point yeah i I like that i was thinking about this whole situation um the the whole al situation in general because you know i appreciate that he's been in excruciating pain for some time um but i was thinking like you know he waited like 30 years or something to try to stop oswald like that it was his (laughs) I don't actually remember how long he was at this, but he he devoted a large chunk of his life to trying to stop Oswald. And he would have needed to wait at most 24 more hours <laughs> to see if Jake would be able to stop him, right? Like, like just, 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 it was inevitably, it was either inevitably, he, he would have his answer one way or the other after, like, you know, the, the next day. And, and that got me thinking, like on some level, maybe, Al wants to die with the hope that Oswald can be stopped because I think he strongly suspects that it's impossible and it would kind of suck to die knowing that, that both him and Jake had totally failed to accomplish this thing mm-hmm. and, mm-hmm. and that he had basically wasted this entire last part of his life. And maybe it's actually more of a relief to just, end it now not knowing whether jake will succeed or not and just having the hope that he will i don't know this may be a lot of projection but i was thinking through like basically for me the ultimate question was like couldn't he just you know dose himself to the gills on painkillers and wait one day to see if jake could pull it off yeah i mean i think that the it takes two minutes regardless of how long they're in there factor in this whole thing is really interesting because my brain kind of forgets it um similarly to the way jake forgets it when he's like oh i gotta feed the cat oh wait no that was like three hours ago um my brain kind of does similar things so i don't think i've ever actually in my head pieced together what you're saying as 100 percent true here that this he only has to survive just as long as it takes for jake to go down those steps and then plus plus two minutes, and then he could figure it out. So I think you're onto something here. I don't know if this is intentional or 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 will even matter at the end of the day. But um, the idea that that he is happier and more content dying, knowing, or, uh, being able to tell himself the story of of I've set this kid on his way and he will be successful. Um, yeah, that that feels right to me. Yeah. All right. Cool. So Jake notices right away that the picture that was taken of Harry Dunning at Al's is gone. And in its place is a random main representative coming to visit him. So we're going to have to talk about time travel shit here, Matt. Here we go. 
Al says he remembers Jake's mission and remembers Harry Dunning, despite them being pretty convinced that Al has never met him in this timeline. And he probably doesn't even live in this town in this timeline. Um, furthermore, he has absolutely no memory of ever meeting the politician that he now has a picture uh, on his wall with, um, let, let alone posing for that picture with him. So Al basically explains this away as proximity to the time portal, which is basically Stephen King's version of propagation of the time wave. <laughs> <laughs> um, ult- ultimately, it's just because like to not do it to not have this would cause like a whole lot of complexity in the story you have to like explain like al and uh, it would just mess everything up so it's easier to just say like we've both been through the portal because we've both been through the portal we retain knowledge of the world before it was changed yada 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 right i guess i mean i i may have had a slightly different takeaway which was something like our character's acknowledge that they don't understand the time travel rules very well because honestly Al's just kind of like, yeah, it's probably <laughs> probably because I went through the tunnel myself. But it's like that. It, it that's not like they don't know that that's the answer. So they're basically just going like, oh well, fuck it, let's try again. And and <laughs> you know, it it, it 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 felt slightly shocking. It's, I guess especially because Al had sort of positioned himself on like this expert on the time hole and how it worked. And then you know this they they do make this change and he and he can't you know his memories are are now out of sync and he's like yeah whatever it's fine i'm gonna be (laughs) killing myself within an hour anyway so yeah sure i I mean you're absolutely right that like it's not a very empirical uh hypothesis here right like they they do nothing to confirm any of this it's just like yeah it's probably because i was near that and then like they 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 kind of retroactively work the yellow card man into this hypothesis right it's like well that's why he's weird too because he's right. near the portal on that side. And so he that's why he can recognize stuff's going on there too, which again, not a not a great piece of evidence, especially given what we see about the yellow card man uh in this chapter. But yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I like I like that read on it a lot. And, and and you know, it also sort of implies something very um, I don't know, maybe dark. I don't know if dark is quite the right word, but just like if they're successful in stopping Oswald and saving JFK, the world will be very different. Mm-hmm. And they will uh, pretend for the sake of argument that Al, that we don't already know that Al killed himself, then the world that they would actually live in in the future would be wildly disjoint with their memories of their own lives. Yeah. So yeah. it's not like you just go back up the, the stairs and you just go back to your life except – you know, Kennedy is alive. It's like, no, all kinds of stuff will be different. People you knew won't have been born. Uh, uh, Yeah, it's, it's, and, and, and so like, it's just good to be clear on this, right? Cause you, you, we didn't know this yet. We thought it was Mm -hmm. possible that like, well, maybe they come out of the hole and like, like in one of my favorite films, Frequency, um, all the memories just flood into their head as they're like standing there. And then they suddenly remember what this new timeline was like, you know? Mm -hmm. So, but that's not what it is. Yeah. I mean, the the thing that you can really start to hurt your brain on this whole thing, Matt is okay. Well, would, would Jake change the future enough that Al would never have opened a diner at this particular spot? You know, like, like that's when, that's when stuff starts to get real fucky when you start going down that line of thinking, right? It's right. like, uh, like this is going to be such a monumental change um, that will propagate out in in how many different ways uh, that we could not possibly know. Uh, like, if 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 America doesn't stick around in Vietnam, like, just a, a billion things will change. <laughs> like, right. like an untrackable number of things will change that could propagate in, in large and small ways. And like, how would that work? Like, like wh- what if, what if in that version, Al doesn't get cancer because he doesn't, he's not a smoker. Right? Like what? And what is, so is he de- like, you know, yeah. like this is just like, you start going down this rabbit right. hole and you're like, wait, 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 yeah. wait, wait, this is messing you, with me. Yeah. You, you start to appreciate, um, the desire of Ka to keep things on track. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. 
Um, so Jake desperately needs some sleep. So he tells Al he'll be uh, back at his place by seven that night uh, for their final preparations. And then uh, he drives him home. As he drives, he finds himself remissing or, or missing his car. It's his nice uh, red convertible back in the 50s. Um, which won't be the first thing he begins missing about 1958. Um, in fact, we kind of see here, Matt, that he's like absolutely homesick for a place that's not really his home, that he really doesn't actually belong. Uh, and, and that ties into what we talked about in the introduction, for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, it's really interesting. I mean, he, he, like his his modern car is like nominally better te- technologically, but it still feels cheap and crappy to him. Um, yeah, he calls which, it a shit um, box, I think. Yeah, which is funny to me because I'm like, I don't know, man. I really like p- power steering quite a bit, <laughs> but uh, but uh, I, I I guess yeah, you get used to the the old stuff for sure. Yeah, I mean, I like the, it's he was able to afford, especially since it wasn't his money, um, a, a probably a, a nicer car than he would have had. Like his life in like his life in the, in the present is a, a dull life of mundane mundane existence, right? You have to go to work. You, you know, you have to, you have bills to pay. You got to buy a car, but he's on a teacher salary. So you probably can't afford like, like a super, super nice car. So he's got to get a car he can afford and it's boring and shitty. And in the 1950s, he's, he's a, a playboy that can toss money around and buy shiny cars and not worried about any of that stuff. So it's just a completely different experience. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So on the way to owls though, they discuss, an interesting idea here, Matt. The, the, the path to the drying shed is chained off by that chain with a sign on it that notes that there's a busted pipe and they're working on fixing it, but don't come back here until we fix that pipe. And uh, Jake poses the question to Al is like, was that there when you returned four years later after your failed um, mission to, to prevent Kennedy's assassination? Uh, was that chain and that sign still there? And Al's like, yeah, yeah. And he's like, huh, you know, I never thought about that before. Why would it take four years to fix a busted pipe? And so the, the thing we're being introduced to here is this kind of idea that someone or something is keeping this area closed, keeping people out of this area perpetually. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's I, I don't really have a, a strong idea here. I, I was thinking maybe if you're going to have a time doorway in the first place, it, it, maybe they only manifest in places that are that are going to be left alone for a long time. Um, I, I don't know. Yeah. I'd be, I'd be, I'd be vaguely surprised if we ever learn like why there's a time doorway here. Like <laughs> I, it, it just sort of seems like the sort of thing where it's like, that's just the conceit. There's a time door. It, it, it is what it is. Um, yeah. I, I don't disagree. I, I just do think it's interesting. We're, we're, we're kind of being told that there are forces at work here, right? That like yeah. that some, something is keeping this area the same um yeah for whatever reason right let's let, let me let's let's expand on that for for, for just a second because because it's all well and good to talk about ka but like we've 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 talked about the idea that ka is is like some sometimes contradictory seeming and paradoxical yeah. and when you think about it it's like okay well you know ka or or something some some force is fighting him when he tries to change the past but also the universe provided this time door <laughs> like uh-huh. so so like it, both of those things are true like it it it, cre- yeah. it it you could say you could phrase it as like ka provided jake with the time door to the past why you know <laughs> for some purpose mm-hmm. um and it's entirely possible he's you know mistaken about what the purpose is but there is it, it, it within this cosmology it wouldn't have happened if there wasn't a reason for it um yeah, I think you're right. I, I, this, these are fun things to think about for sure because the the uh, we're we're kind of wrestling with these ideas at the same time. And, and we, I think we talked about this back in in uh, his first trip to Derry, right, where Jake encounters the losers, and the losers we we get some some strong turtle feeling that these people were meant to to meet each other, um, and there and therefore Jake was meant to get the information from them that helps him on his quest. But then you're like, well, wait a minute, <laughs> is so is is are these opposing forces working against each other or is this just the the greater ka like what 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 is going on here right and right. i think this is an, another great ex- just the existence of the time portal itself is another great example of that of like and 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 perhaps getting to the bottom of what we're trying to say with this thing 
Um, yeah. Don't know yet, but uh, yeah, interesting stuff for sure. Yep. Uh, along with that, we get some some other ideas uh, in this conversation. The first one is that Al's cancer might not just be a result of his basically near constant smoking, uh, but perhaps this is the obdurate past um, kind of working against him and, and punishing him for his attempts to change things, giving him a, a friendly present, if you will. Yeah, the thought crossed my mind at some previous point that maybe the cancer was the past, making sure Al couldn't interfere anymore. I mean, if it's capable of interfering with Jake's body by giving him stomach aches and headaches, it's, it's you're kind of like, well, you know, are, are there limits? Probably not, yeah. right? So, yeah, I mean, it, if you can if you can make a stomach virus appear in someone's stomach via magic, the universe correcting magic, you can certainly make a cell become cancerous, right? I mean. Why, why would why would one work and the other wouldn't? Yeah, um, and it tried to kill Jake with a truck running a red light. So it's like, yeah. there's it's not exactly pulling its punches. Sure, yeah. Uh, I, I, we also realize another thing as Al gets to his house, he uh, his nurse is is there waiting for him, angry with him for not being there to take his medication. And we learn his nurse's name is Doris, as in Doris Dunning. Um, this is kind of Jake's first introduction to us. The, this cop, this concept of the past and present echoing against each other, especially when you're you're tinkering and changing with things. Uh, this is not the last time we'll see this in this this week's reading, um, and it's based on the way Jake talks about this stuff. It's not going to be the last time in the book at all either. Uh, any anything to make about this, Matt? Um, not really. Uh, I, I mean, I know I I just think about the fact that King often likes to sort of make things rhyme, make things be symmetric. Mm-hmm. um have have there there be a feeling of you know serendipity to things i don't know that i have much more to say beyond that at this point sure yeah no that, that's fair that's fair just just a concept i wanted to make sure we we touched on when it was introduced by the novel sure makes sense so after some sleep jake wakes up and spends uh the time before his meet up with al Doing some research, he finds some articles about the people of Lisbon Falls looking into the mysterious disappearance of George Amberson, um, and he feels powerful at that, that he, he that was him. He was there. He impacted the past. Uh, and there's, of course, no connections to the events in Derry. Um, he he handled that perfectly. And, and speaking of Derry, he also checks out what happens at the the Dunnings house and and Bill Turcott's inclusion in the events at the Dunnings has, as you predicted last week, Matt, kind of put a nice little bow on any everything. They're not looking for anyone else because they don't need to find anyone else. They have everything here. Uh, the other thing we see is that Jake notes how the news article got many of the details wrong in, in ways that would put holes in the narrative that the news is constructing. Like it, it, it again doesn't mention that it was a sledgehammer. It, it says that Turcott showed up and stabbed uh, Dunning uh, in like, in, a, in an altercation with him, but he was stabbed from behind. So that doesn't really line up. And and I wonder about this just, you know, is this just as Jake kind of puts it more dairy being dairy where they just kind of write a story and they don't really care about the truth. They just want to move on and, and forget it ever happened. But I do think you can't help but wonder if this is laying the seeds of something JFK related, right? Mm-hmm. Or maybe, maybe that, you know, we, we've talked about the conspiracy theories Maybe this is this is opening the door for some of the details of the JFK assassination uh, to be wrong, or or maybe not. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, um, entirely possible. I mean, it, it's it's interesting. So, so one thing that jumps to mind there is just the fact that the JFK assassination has all these conspiracy theories surrounding it, um, which uh, what uh, amusingly like the complexity of the situation surrounding jfk's assassination could be due to just all the dozens and dozens of time travelers who who try and stop uh, to, to, <laughs> who, who tr- try to stop it and then fail um uh, or and, maybe and then, oswald is a time traveler maybe Oswald. that's that's an interesting thought and too he's trying to make sure he, <laughs> jfk yeah. is assassinated yeah so so like that's why there's that's why there's all this con- confusion around the issue um that's a fun that's a fun thought i don't know if we're gonna go that way um probably <laughs> not um you know another way that i was just thinking about the nature of all this is like the past kind of bends itself into knots to minimize the impact of things to, to damp out that butterfly effect. Um, one might imagine, you know, just, I, I kind of did a little thought experiment. Like imagine, imagine, um, you know, Jake leaves his, uh, his cell phone in the middle of times square. Um, 
you know, what would have happened. It's like, well, probably it would have just been like swept into a gutter by a street sweeper and, and ignored and nothing would have happened. <laughs> uh-huh. It's like, okay, well, what if he'd like handed it to, to an engineer? Um, it's like, well, the engineer probably would have decided it was a prank and thrown it away. It's like, okay, well, what if he had handed it to an engineer, explained how it worked and explained that he was from the future and the engineer wrote up a report on it and then like the report would be lost. And, and like, like it's like the, the, this is just the pattern, not that this is stuff that happened in the story, but I'm just like thinking of the way the way the time stream sort of nudges things back into the channels where they should have been anyway. And, um, and uh, comparing that to the situation with, with dairy, it's like, it can't quite make the situation be the way it, it was before, but it tries to sort of tidy everything up and make it seem unremarkable so that no extra ripples are created by this event. Um, no more than necessary. That's fun. I like that a lot. I like that. that. That's just, you know, it's like, I could be like just flat out wrong about this, but that's, that's kind of how I'm seeing the, the, the way this universe works. Um, and it's fun. Yeah. It's fun. No, that's a very fun interpretation of things for sure. Um, no, I, <laughs> sorry. I'm just digesting it. I like that a lot, actually. <laughs> cool. Cool. Uh, so finally, Jake goes looking for details on Harry Dunning himself. He finds no contact information for any Dunning except for Ellen, who he calls out of the blue and that's when uh, he finds out, Matt, that that uh, Harold Dunning is dead. He went to Vietnam and died during the Tet Offensive. Oops. Uh, yeah. I feel like I should have seen this coming, honestly. <laughs> like, like this is one of those things where as soon as it's revealed, I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, this 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 young person who happens to be of draft age right around when the Vietnam War starts suddenly uh, doesn't have um, a, a damaged limb. Uh, uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. Oops. And Oops. and this is this Matt is where like it this is so fun, right? Because this is where you realize that the exact thing that you were talking about last week is happening. This this idea that we don't care about JFK. We don't really care except for like from a, a fun thought experiment level, right? And, and 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 that's mostly because Jake doesn't really care about JFK. We've not been been by any character in the story been made to actually care about something directly related to the uh, assassination of the president. Um, Jake cares about Harry Dunning, though. And and the question that you had, and the question that we've kind of been pondering, is how the hell is this book going to transition from Jake's immediate, important, and emotionally high stakes quest of saving Harry Dunning's life and his family's life? to jake's eventual quest to save jfk how are we going to get stakes how are we going to get buy-in how are we going to get this real character shit and the answer is right here that here it is it's obvious um harry to save harry you also have to prevent vietnam from happening how do we do that john f kennedy and uh thus jake swallowed the spider to catch the fly um <laughs> just I, I, I mean it is kind of a bad sign that for every change you make, you've now got to make another change to compensate for it. So the yeah. results aren't, it's like, okay, well, what do you, th- what do you think happens next, Jake? Yeah. When like, does it end? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what, what, what happens if, okay, so he doesn't go to Vietnam, but then he uh, gets in an accident with a drunk driver and dies. It's like, okay, fuck. I got to I got to kill his dad, save JFK kill the drunk driver <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, or, or like you know I, I mean or just like saving jfk causes some other horrible thing like like it yes you save jfk maybe you end vietnam but then some other horrible thing happens and now he's like oh shit now i gotta now i gotta fix that and it's like no yeah, you can't yeah. you, you can't be responsible for everything mm-hmm. um which is an interesting way of looking at this yeah, I, I do really like what Ellen Dunning says here. Um, she's talking to him and she says, I took him to the airport after he got his orders and his leave was over. He was going to Nam, and I told him to watch his ass. He said, don't worry, sis. I've got a guardian angel to watch out for me, remember? So where were you on the 6th of February, 1968, Mr. Angel? Where were you when my brother died at the Quezon? Where were you then, you son of a bitch? And this is fun, right? Like, the, uh-huh. it's not the not the last time he's going to be called the guardian angel. Right. Um, yeah. But then this is, this is his help. The, the thing that he was trying to do to do a good thing and, and look what it did to him. Like, I guess the argument here that, that Ellen is making, and, and I don't know how much this will hold up, but the argument here is that perhaps Harry lived his life 
a little more recklessly because he assumed he had this person that was going to magically appear every time he was in danger. It's possible. It's possible. I mean, let's not forget, or I'm sort of saying this to myself. Let me not forget that she wouldn't even be here to talk to him. <laughs> sure. If so, sure. so like the, the, the thing is, Jake is not in a place where he's doing the utilitarian calculation of like how many no. lives did yeah. I save versus how many I versus versus the one that I traded for him. Basically, um, it, to, to him, he really just cares about his friend Harry, and mm-hmm. not satisfactory to him that he basically left the guy worse off. Um, so, mm-hmm. um, but no, I mean, it's. It, I, I think I'm just reminding myself like he did have a positive impact. It just wasn't the impact he wanted to have. So yeah. No, you're right. You're right. So uh, Jake heads back to Al's at their agreed upon time. But uh, at Al, he finds he finds him dead. A suicide, apparently. He took all his pain pills and he leaves Jake a note. Uh, Al, Al is kind of brilliant here, right? I mean, Jake kind of catches on this immediately. He's put a clock on things now. If Jake is going to go, he can't dawdle. He can't think about it. He's got to go now because the second Al's body is discovered, they're going to shut down uh, the diner he's not going to be able to get back to the portal and that'll be that so so this is it um so he kind of used his death as a tool just like in uh shogun yeah <laughs> <laughs> ah you know how to make me appreciate something um, <laughs> no you're 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 totally right um it forces his hand forces him even if he were still waffling and equivocating he has to go um and it gives him a bit of a time time crunch too i mean even if yep. you know like his Okay, so just just reminding everyone, I haven't read this book, so I have no idea, like, how many times is he going to need to do this? Like, Mm -hmm. for all I know, it's one or 50. So, but like 50 only takes a couple hours if you're just going through the portal over and over and over and over and over because it's just two minutes each time. Mm -hmm. So, so the point is. He he has he has at least you know a day to, to to handle this, but he doesn't have he 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 has to be on it. He has to be he has to be spending that time in the past, or his window of opportunity expires. I'm just saying my thought process out loud here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we didn't talk about this, but I also like the conversation that he and Al have about how many attempts Jake actually has at this thing realistically, right? Like he, I think I think Jake is like 36 or something, right? And so. If if we're talking like five years for the first attempt, he basically gets to say like, you don't know what's going to happen in 10 years from now, 10 years, you'll be in your mid forties. Um, you don't have as many times that this as you think you're going to do. If you're going to make it all the way to the, to the, uh, 22nd of November. Um, so uh, the, there's, there's a clock on it no matter what, but yes, this, this becomes a much more clear and, and you have to act now, um, or, or else. Moment yeah for us i guess i'm i'm just just to clarify kind of what i meant like he's uh he, he could screw up far quicker than the, the yeah. full five years but but yes i mean if he's gonna make if he's gonna try to make the full run he only has maybe like two of those in him um, yeah but as we'll see at the end of this week's reading like he's also adding a, a list of steps he ha- he must accomplish each time yeah. now right like he's got a he, he's got this series of things he has to do now um, I mean, we, we joked about Groundhog Day a few weeks ago, but the, essentially that, right? Like he's, mm-hmm. his days are becoming chock full of all these things he must accomplish before he can start on the mission. And and if if he jumps back multiple times, um, that's going to continue to go up every time he does something. So, yeah. Yeah. But anyway, uh, he, he decides, of course, he's going, he's going now. He packs his bags, uh, his one briefcase, and he walks down into the past once again and our chapter ends with him ready for his usual interaction with the yellow card man this this time ready to give him the full dollar he's asking for but instead of the man he finds his corpse uh the yellow card man has slit his throat and the card well it's it's black now matt it's it's jet black and when he touches it later he describes it as feeling like skin Uh uh-huh matt what's What's going on here? That's not good. That's particularly worrisome. <laughs> I don't think I need to explain why. <laughs> it's, 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 I mean, that's that's like you know Necronomicon coded shit. That's like yeah, yeah. It's like we're in sort of an evil. Uh, this this is a this is a very stark warning. Um, 
Um, I, I, and, and we also don't really know what it means. Like, is it is it a warning telling him that this doorway is about to go poof? Yeah. Is it a yeah. warning telling him to stop it or he's going to be killed? Is it is it not a warning at all? Is it just like, you know, the man literally like Al said that that man was sort of exposed to this like temporal radiation from the door from the door to the degree that that makes any goddamn sense. And, and, you know, maybe that's why Al has cancer. It, it's just, it just messes people up. Um, yeah. when they go through, I, I don't know. These are all, it, it see, I, I think, I think I love it as this vague warning where it could be any, any or none of the things I just said. Um, it just makes mm-hmm. you worried. Yeah. I mean, it makes you wonder what this story would be like if you just cut this yellow card man character out of it. Right. Like, cause you would have a much, you would have a much different feeling about the things that Jake's trying to do because uh, this this character has from the beginning represented this thing that does not quite line up with our understanding of the rules of the of time travel. Yeah. And now here yeah. again, things have changed. We don't know why. It's another suicide. Which which by the way, there's like two characters that uh, Jake has seen within like two hours that have committed suicide. Um, and yeah, we just don't know what to do with it. But it it it. it, it creates this immediate level of uh, ominousness to it that like okay and and, and it is interesting to, to your point <laughs> that jake just kind of says oh that's weird yeah okay huh. all right on with the mission <laughs> like it's he true, doesn't yeah. really stop to stop to, to he doesn't give it more than kind of a, a quick cursory thought of you know what what could this possibly mean um you know like your reaction to it is is very negative and very oh this isn't good this could be something extraordinarily bad we know this guy doesn't quite play uh, in the rules that everyone else in the past plays in so what does this changing state of him mean um and he's like eh, i don't know let's move on yeah right especially the uh, absolute ominousness of it being a black card made of skin and uh, yeah yeah and, and also just to say it aloud the the cutting of you know cutting your own throat is a pretty non-standard method of suicide like mm-hmm. it, it, I, don't, I don't even even know uh, you know that's just not how people do it right it's just very difficult yeah. to do that um but he does it so it just kind of indicates how deranged his mind has become yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree, but we just we just don't know. Um, it, it's just this this element that was introduced to the story to just make us think and uh, and worry, <laughs> and that's all we're gonna do. Yeah, yeah. Jake's not gonna do it, so we'll do it for him. Yep. All right, chapter ten. So as we head into this chapter and the rest of this week's reading, I do want to stop and and comment on kind of the shift in tone these chapters have. It, it feels to me, and maybe you'll disagree with me, but I I. I I feel like there's very much like a hurry up and get it over with feeling of these pages. Like, like I remember the, the, the way we talked about Derry and the way we talked about his events in Derry the first time around. And they, it, it was very slow. It was very deliberate. The language was, you know, while negative, um, kind of very beautiful and in, in how it chose to, to pick words. And it's not just the pace of the novel here, but I think just the way King is writing it. Um, it's just like, let's just get this over, get this over, get this over. Let's just move through it as, as quickly as possible. Um, uh, do you, do you agree with me on that? You mean like the, this section as we're, as we're sort of heading back to the past specifically, basically everything in dairy, uh, from, from, from here oh, on oh, yeah, yeah. through, through his time in dairy. I, I see what you mean. Yeah. Y- yeah. I mean, basically it's like, I think he, I think King is, is aware of like, this is going to be r- real, boring if if <laughs> or, or, or or like i don't want to telegraph the sense of like now we're gonna do all that stuff again because mm-hmm. you'll just be like no we just did this um i mean it's yeah. literally like edge of tomorrow where that movie is very clever about what it chooses to show you more than once yeah and doesn't and like while the whole point of that movie is that it is repeating itself over and over it's it's very it's very thoughtful about how much it actually, um, you know, uh, uh, uses that because because you would be you would actually just start rolling your eyes and fidgeting if it really, you know, made you feel the way the character feels, which is that he's literally doing the same things over and over day after day. Yeah. Um, 
So, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, we basically rushed to the point where we're getting to new stuff and we just kind of showed the new stuff is, is the way I would I, I agree. Say. I mean, I think, you know, I, I really like these these time loop stories like uh, lived. I repeat, really like it. Um, Groundhog Day. And, and I, one of the most fun parts of watching those movies and reading these kind of stories is the fir- like the initial day, the first loop um, where you can kind of see and play the game of like, let's see which things that the movie is clearly gesturing towards me to like mark as um as a uh, landmarks for changes or differences in in future loops right um and we kind of do that here in this in this chapter right there are there are specific events and things that happen just as they happened before um that that Jake is is pointing out but yeah we don't want to get bogged down too much in this and also Jake is is very clearly on a mission here his, his this th- Harry Dunning in this time is not the main focus of what he's trying to do here anymore. And so I do think like the, the Watsonian and, and doyalistic like requirements for moving through this as quickly as possible, just kind of match up to each other perfectly. Like Mm -hmm. King wants to get through it as fast as possible because he doesn't want to bore us. Um, Jake wants to get through it as fast as possible because he knows he's got work to do after this. Yeah. And also just, just to nail it in, like Jake's attitude has shifted from kind of being tentative and uncertain, um, particularly about Frank to just being like, I'm going to put this guy in the ground. Let's yeah. be efficient and, uh, yep. and, and just get it done. Mm-hmm. No, you're right. You're right. Uh, th- another thing I wanted to point out here, Matt. So basically, because of the corpse of the the yellow card man, uh, Jake has to move quickly, which matches what we were just talking about. Um, he hops a bus to to kind of head out of town uh, near the hotel he's going to be staying at, and and there's this very particular moment here where Jake like is uh, walking down the road, and then after a few minutes, finds himself whistling and smiling and happy to be back in 1958 it's it, the text even says it was good to be back and he's just like he's 30 minutes removed from witnessing two suicides um yeah. and, and embarking on this incredibly dangerous thing and and just seeing the way i, th- I think this is why i said addiction to the past in, in the intro because you just see the way he like immediately is like oh it's everything's okay though because i'm back now right Right. Yeah. I think at this point, after having spent so much time in the past, even if it weren't, you know, the imperative to save Harry and he he didn't have this mission, I think he would still want to be in the past. I think he, he likes it there more. He prefers it. Yeah. No, I think, I think I agree. Yep. Uh, speaking of this, I really like the note that King puts here that his his first night in the hotel this time around, he sleeps soundly, which is a direct contrast to how his first night went uh, the first time he came into 1958, that the, the quiet disturbed him. He couldn't get comfortable. He, his thoughts kind of overwhelmed him. Uh, none of that this time. He's comfortable here. This is his home in his mind now. Yep. Love it. So Jake rebuys his car, his suitcase and his clothes, purchasing actually the exact same shirt he's already wearing which just hurts my brain (laughs) really, really bad. It's the same shirt. I love it. Those molecule there. He just duped. He duped them. He duped it. Dupe dupe trick. It's the same (laughs) shirt. Now I love that. It made me so happy that where he's like, Oh, you like that? It's the same shirt. Same exact shirt. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, So then he heads back to dairy. Um, And, uh, and while he, we, when he gets to dairy, like before, like he checks into the same, apartment he lived at there's no more of like flowery language about how much this place sucks or anything there's no more beautiful se- sequences with our losers club it's just jake on a mission and uh, and his mission is to murder someone but also matt we see here as he's waiting for that fateful day uh, he decides to make some money betting on the 58 world series he finds a bookie by asking the bartender at the lamplighter where he can get in on some action and matt i just i just want to note this here uh, he says, you want to put your money where your mouth is? And Jake says, sure, a fin. I make it a point not to take any more than a five spot from the wage slaves. And I just like, look at how he's a fin. Jake's never said a fin before. Uh-huh. I, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> it's $5. Oh, man. I don't know where it comes from, but it's, it's $5. Where do you pick this up? <laughs> Here. That's, that's so good. I love it. Apparently, Finn has uh, German Yiddish roots. 
and is remotely related to the English five. Okay. Makes sense. <laughs> Makes sense. But yeah, so he's he's kind of talking like a person from the 50s now, right? Yeah, yeah. So Jake finds out that the local bookie is none other than our old friend Chaz Fratty. Uh, I, I love this quote here. Did I know what he was going to say next? No, I'm not that prescient. Was I surprised? No, again, because the past isn't just obdurate. It's in harmony with both itself and the future. I experienced that harmony time and again. So this is what we were talking about before, right? With Doris Dunning and, and Doris, the the um, the nurse, this, this fact that the past is kind of harmonizing and, and characters that were mattered for one thing continue to matter. Like it's, it's almost as if it's a book. Yeah, it's <laughs> Ka, baby. <laughs> Uh, so Jake heads heads into Fratis and asks for the odds he can get for 500 bucks on the Yankees to win the World Series. He first gets even odds, but in order to up them, he gets a bit more specific. He says, what if I pick them specifically to win in seven coming back uh, from a three to one deficit and is eventually able to tack, talk Chaz into seven to one odds. So basically he would get paid out seven times the $500 he puts in. And, and I like. For for those of our listeners and readers that don't like know sports very well, um, coming back from a three to one deficit is an extremely rare thing. I think it's happened 13 times, 14 times total in Major League Baseball in the hundred and something years it's been around. Uh, it just doesn't happen very often. So like let's once again, let's remind ourselves that this is illegal betting he's doing right this is not legal um and we we've been told the Chaz has some has some quote unquote powerful friends and this is incredibly reckless because it's one thing to just bet on a, on a, a sure thing but to to dive down into the details like this and make a claim like before the series even starts to make a claim that i know this is going to go to seven not only that i know the yankees are gonna go down three games to one and come back um the, the yeah, odds of that incredibly unlikely yeah i i know i mean i don't i don't know sports as well as you but just just thinking about the situation i mean i guess what bothers me about it particularly is that he he is the one to offer this outlandish you know set of circumstances mm-hmm. it's not like the, it, it, it would be one thing if this was a bet on offer and he was and he was like you know all right you know th- this you know uh, you, you go to the horse races and you see all the different races and you just you you can you can bet whatever you want and no, nothing really catches anybody's attention because people are betting all kinds of crazy shit all the time but like this is him articulating yeah this highly unusual thing and then and then winning and it's it's um it's yeah. uh, suspicious he he's walked into town the new person um walked into a bookie and made this outlandish incredibly rare bet that ends up being completely correct right like this draws an incredible amount of attention for sure. And the fact that he knows that the odds of this happening make it so seven to one odds are actually pretty shitty for him and yet still takes it. That's suspicious too, right? It's like, yeah. why would you put down $500 on this with such shitty odds for the likelihood of this happening are like a million to one. Uh, that's suspicious too. And nothing comes of this this time right but we know this is his plan going forward is that he is going to make money by placing these kind of bets and this is demonstrating that he is behaving incredibly reckless recklessly drawing an incredible amount of attention to himself and it doesn't seem like he's really aware of it like i think he just seems like a guy who's never really thought about sports betting at all ever yeah yeah and so to him this is just like for, for all he knows he's being super savvy and and doesn't realize how obvious this is yeah yeah and again like he doesn't have to win this much money at at, at a, a single solitary time right like you can just take even odds here and make a little bit of money and just continue right. to do that and lay low and not draw attention to yourself as the miraculous winner of impossible bets right <laughs> yeah yeah, well, we'll see. I mean, like I said, nothing comes of this uh, this week. But uh, but but this is this is no spoilers. But this is not going to be the last time he's going to have to gamble to get money. I I am excited to see what horrible mistakes he makes in the future. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, so, so the bet made, um, I, we get this line that I love back then the baseball was played as it was meant to be played in bright afternoon sunshine and on days in the early fall when it still felt like summer. Uh, this is like something that my dad has exactly articulated himself before <laughs> that, like they kept pushing when the world series occurs back and back and back. So it just gets colder and colder. Um, so many of these, uh, these fields are indoors now, so it's not a big deal, but, um, then they also put them in prime time. This is just not the way it was it used to be. And my dad has, has longingly remembered the times when baseball was on during the day. And uh, uh-huh. and it was nice outside still. There's something dystopian about just the general idea of using artificial lighting for sports. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's because of television. It's because of prime time. It's ruined uh-huh. everything. It, it has ruined everything. Everything used to be better in the 1950s. <laughs> So as the baseball games go on, Jake works around town. He's trying to make plans and contingencies for the resistance of the obdurate past. He hires a, a standby mechanic. Uh, he gets some stomach medicine. Um, we also see him buy a little standpipe decorative pillow, which we know that he will eventually use as a silencer for Frank Dunning's murder, which is just delightful <laughs> as a constant yeah. reader. You're just like, oh, oh, Stephen. I mean, Pennywise probably loved this, actually. Oh, yeah, sure. Pennywise was like, oh, and you're using a dairy pillow, too. That's like, that's, <laughs> you know what? I'll allow it. Um, uh, but yeah, no, this is all, all, all fun stuff. You know, I, I love, um, like you said, we do move through this fairly quickly, but we do get a good amount of Jake carefully thinking through all the places where his plan could go wrong. Yeah. And and uh, we sort of get this delightful bit where we don't necessarily see him putting all these plans into place, but we do see them uh, activated when, you know, the day of actually happens and he has to, he has to think his way around, um, you know, basically outflanking Ka. Um, Mm -hmm. It's great. It's great. Yeah. So I I wanted to read this part and talk about this with you because I just find this really fascinating. Jake says, I said I stayed away from the lamplighter when I thought Frank Dunning might be there because I already knew everything about him that I needed to know. It's the truth, but not all of the truth. I need to make that clear. If I don't, you'll never understand why I behaved as I did in Texas. Imagine coming into a room and seeing a complex multi-story house of cards on the table. Your mission is to knock it over. If that was all, it would be easy, wouldn't it? A hard stamp of the foot or a big puff of air, the kind you muster when it's time to blow out all the birthday candles, would be enough to do the job. But that's not all. The thing is, you have to knock the house of cards down at a specific moment in time. Until then, it must stand. So this is basically this this beautiful thing where Jake is basically saying he knows where Frank Dunning is going to be on the 5th of October, and that is where he wants to kill Frank Dunning. And so he can't change anything in Frank Dunning's life enough inadvertently or purposefully that would affect his ability to show up at the cemetery on the 5th of October. Um, And it's such a fun concept of you can't change anything until you need to change the one big thing uh, and and the, the challenge that that represents to everything. And I love using the house of cards as a way of, of uh, illustrating that. I think it's just great. Yeah. It reminds me of the house of cards from the dark tower. Um, delightfully. Yeah. Um, that's, well, it's that's probably because that was our discussion question answer we got last week talking that's, about that specifically. That's, that's true. I'm sure that is why it comes to mind so readily, but also, <laughs> also I think it, I mean, it feels it feels connected in some thematic way, but no, I, I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> uh, but no, I, I mean, it it's uh, it, it makes sense, right? It's like you said, it makes total sense. You've got the past semi intelligently working against you, so you have to move really carefully to catch it with its pants down. Um, meaning, you know, you got to set a trap, basically. Um, and I, I, I was thinking about also like. All, all yeah, I, I'm I'm gonna continue to use Ka as a stand-in for like the force operating against Frank uh, against sure. Jake until um, until I know otherwise. Um, so like all Ka had to do to stop Jake from killing Frank would be to give Frank a flat tire on this particular day, right? Mm-hmm. Like then Frank can't make it to his own assassination, and jake's plan is foiled and jake would have to find some other way to do it which would really put a damper in, on things but so it's interesting because it seems like ka maybe can't maybe won't do that because i don't know that would be maybe 
changing fate itself instead of just letting things happen. I, I, I mean, it, it's it seems constrained to affects the impact either only Jake or, or primarily Jake, like giving Jake a stomach yeah. ache, get, get, you know, hurting Jake's car, giving Jake a, a headache. Um, these are all things that really directly only influence Jake. And then Jake, you know, he then takes some action. So there's secondary consequences that affect other people, obviously. But um, it's just interesting because, because if, yeah. if you're, if you're this, you know, if you're a car, if you're, if you're the universe or whatever, then there's so many other things you could do to stop this, but it seems to only be able to employ weapons that are like directed specifically at him. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the way to frame this uh, that I like is pretend Jake is a virus and the past is a, 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 an animal, a body, right? Mm-hmm. And the past is doing all it can to eliminate the virus. Um, and it might inadvertently hurt <laughs> the body in its attempts to do that. Like, I think the perfect example of what you're saying is you can't make Frank miss being at the cemetery on the 5th of October because that that that's what happened. He was on at the cemetery on the 5th of October. However, uh, we do see that uh, Jake is almost hit by a car um, or his car is almost hit by a car on his way to the cemetery. So if that had happened, that certainly would have changed the past, right? <laughs> the, the, the person who hit him would have been changed as well. Um, so there are kind of repercussions even even in, in, in the past's attempt to fight the virus that is, that is Jake um, Epping. But yeah, it, it, most of its strength and effort is pointed at the virus itself, at Jake. I like that, yeah. But just basically it has to be direct for some reason. Yeah, yep, yep. So on the morning of November, uh, October 5th, Jake wakes up not with a stomach ache, but with a terrible, terrible migraine. Uh, I, I copied this line for just for you, Matt. Are there people who have such headaches not just occasionally but frequently? If so, God help them. Yes, yes. God help <laughs> those poor, poor, poor souls out there who have frequent yeah. headaches. Yeah, it was, I can't even imagine. Can you imagine I, what that's like? I, you know, Scott, I have a pretty good imagination, <laughs> to be honest with you. Yeah, I, I am, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, buddy. I know, I know. I, I've uh, not to, not to rub it in your face. I don't think I've ever had a migraine in my life. Um, I've had bad headaches, but I don't think they would ever be classified as migraine level um but i even those bad headaches i was like jesus christ this is awful so i i absolutely cannot imagine for for what it's worth i felt like this was a pretty excellent description of a, of a <laughs> migraine um actually oh good so. yeah i wonder if if king just did research or if he gets them i don't actually know yeah i don't i don't really have a firm sense of how common they actually are because they run in families and so a disproportionate number of people i know suffer from them but then mm, mm-hmm. there will be people you run into who are like i've never had a headache and i'm like i never had you. a headache like at all i've 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 had people say that i don't believe those people exist <laughs> i i i don't know man i've I, it, it weirds me out too but um <laughs> yeah uh, but but the migraine, Matt, is not the only thing that Jake has. Uh, the banister snaps on his way down the stairs, almost making him fall. He, his pants have miraculously developed a hole in them, and then th- therefore his keys have fallen through. Then his car won't start, having developed uh, both a dead battery cable and corroded spark plugs. Even the spare tire is flat. Um, this is this is interesting, Matt. I think we're kind of seeing the the obdurance of the past work in. You've seen Final Destination, right? Uh huh. Uh, Oh, the first one. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like, it can't just come right. Like the the past can't like come right out and and stop you and be like, Hey, stop it. But it can like slowly turn the heat up in your sauna and drop the broom over the door, locking you in. And then you'll, (laughs) you'll probably die from that. Um, Uh The the way it can and can't act is interesting. Cause yeah, like the, the world, the physical world is being directly influenced. Like, there's a hole in his pocket. There's a spark plug suddenly corroded that was fine the day before. The, the the spare tire has all these leaks in it. And it's not like it's not like the obdurate past is like sending a person to come like pop open Jake's trunk and punch a bunch of holes in his spare tire. That's it's just it's just happening. It's just uh you know, just just random events like Murphy's Law type events, right? Um, which is really interesting. Yeah, it seems almost that it's easier for it to impact 
inanimate objects, um, mm-hmm. which I guess is just kind of interesting because, like you just said, it, it, I feel like there are versions of this type of story where it's like only human will can be influenced by the supernatural force. But this is actually more like actually human will seems fairly robust in some sense. And it's 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 all the other stuff that's being kind of tweaked, but only in small ways, like a little hole in the pocket here and there. You know, it's it's a uh, mm-hmm. it's it's like there's some there's some limits from from things being too ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. And another wrinkle in this that I also find really interesting is that it also seems to like eventually give up a little bit. Like if you push your way through, it just seems to go, okay, fine. You win. (laughs) Because when Jake gets to the cemetery, after all the things that happened to him, after almost dying, um, after, after having all the stuff, having that mechanic that's able to fix things, being able to find his keys, um, he gets to the cemetery to wait for, for Frank Dunning to show up and his headache starts to go away. And by the time he's doing the, the murder itself, he basically feels fine now. And so it's like, it's just it's like the past just said, all right, all right, fine. Yeah, you win. Um, <laughs> it, it is really interesting, right? Because you would think that the moment just before he's able to intervene and change the past w- would be the moment when the plan is most fragile. Like, yeah, you know, the gun jams or something like that. And, and then Frank charges him and then all bets are off. But but no, it just kind of lets things play out once once it has it's almost like the 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 past or car or whatever has like exhausted itself and um exhausted whatever cosmic currency it had to try to to keep mm-hmm. things on track and now it's it's um it's just it's just gonna let it happen um yeah i wonder if it's like you know predators that have this innate knowledge of um you know chasing this animal at this point will cost more energy than i would get from it like there's just mm. like innate understanding and 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 there's this idea that the past is eventually just like continuing to try to prevent this thing would cause more changes than we that we're trying to prevent possibly i don't know i'm just yeah just speculating but i i, I like that i mean i i think that's what i was trying to say but i don't think I, I succeeded where it's like the more the more ridiculous things happen to try to stop him from killing this guy the more obvious it is and and then and then that creates its own disruption um, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. I, I agree with you cool um so <laughs> headache goes away um and we get this part here <laughs> i just love i went to the front door of the tracker vaults to wait for dunning just as oswald five years from now would no doubt wait for kennedy the kennedy motorcade and his shooters blind on the sixth floor of the texas school book depository so i just love so much jake in this moment comparing himself to oswald the person he's ostensibly going to stop but here he he makes himself the assassin he is uh, lee harvey oswald in this moment yeah um for sure I, I i love that out of all the ways jake could kill him we have him um you know shoot him um, yeah m- multiple times mm-hmm. so finally dunning shows up to the cemetery jake walks up to him and shoots him three times and uh just like that it's done he's he's murdered someone he's become a murderer and uh, the line that I love here is, I slept like a baby that night because he knows or he believes that what he did was the right thing to do and the better yep. thing to do, ultimately. Yep. He, he uh, make, makes sense. I mean, he, he knows what a monster yeah. this guy is. He, he has confirmation. Yeah. Um, and for the record, I'm not arguing that he's wrong. I'm just yeah. commenting on the, the, when, it, when it makes specific uh, effort to say, I slept like a baby that night. Right. Well, we, yeah, I mean, we're we're tracking where this character is, and he went from this guy who, who was literally so hesitant that after writing down, kill him question mark on a piece yeah. of paper, he then burned it, and now he has now done that thing and feels no remorse about it. Mm-hmm. Um, so he, we've we've moved Jake forward in the uh, a, a, along the axis of uh, I don't know um, conviction, um, <laughs> but. Yeah. Um, so, so I was trying to figure out if if he used the same number of shots as Oswald because that would be even more of a parallel. And I can tell you with certainty that either two or three shots were fired in the Kennedy assassination, um, depending on which uh, conspiracy theory you believe. <laughs> but um, probably probably two shots though. Mm-hmm. Unclear though, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, I, I refuse to engage you and go down a 
a conspiracy theory <laughs> rabbit hole, though. Okay, that's fine. I, I so 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 I did want to bring one thing up, which it, it's kind of morbid, but I mean the subject matter of this book is is morbid, so sure. figured I'd mention it. And this is as good a place as any. Um, have you ever seen the you know actual Zapruder film, the 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 footage of the assassination? I hadn't, but then you put it in the script, and I I went and watched it, and uh, it's harrowing it's it's horrible right yeah like you grow up in this country and you're told about these things and maybe you even see like a a piece of that film of that footage like i I think i've seen the clip with jackie like on the trunk of the car yeah but you don't really see anything particularly grotesque but the whole like the whole film is out there and you can watch i i I almost don't want to say it because it's like it's like genuinely upsetting. But like, you you, you can see the man be killed on the yeah, on the see, film. You you see his brains like yeah. fly out of his head. You, like yeah. you can see that. You, you see his head explode. Basically, I was yeah. that's what I was trying not to say. But it, it's it's, <laughs> sorry, it's horrible. No, no. I mean, it's it's it, you're right. I mean, it's like why why be coy? Um, but but it is like. It's one thing to just like know that fact, right? It's mm-hmm. another to see it and just be like, "That's that was a guy. He was, yeah, uh, he was just going about his day and this horrible thing." And like, yeah, I don't know, his like, wife I, is sitting right next to him, and like, yeah, I mean, we, yeah. We, you're right. We've all seen the Jackie Kennedy like on the, but like seeing her kind of leaning over, like it. <sighs> It's really messed up, man. Yeah. It's re- like she's like leaning over to look at him and and when it hits, I don't know if that's like the second shot hits his brain or not cuz like yeah. he's like leaning forward and she's leaning over like to check on him or something and that's when Yeah. The his, the first his shot head explodes. The first shot hit him in the back of the neck and came out yeah. the front of his neck and then the second shot hit him in the head. So that's um that's the the you know the main line e- even if you go to wikipedia it's quite confusing to figure out like okay but like what actually happened um yeah. but that's that's probably what actually happened but um yeah i guess i'm just mentioning it cuz i mean my i i can honestly say that like before i saw that film i had a very like academic feeling about the whole jfk assassination yeah and, and this was years ago that i saw this film i don't even know why i think it was just like it it's, it was on youtube and it's like oh the thing and um and I was, and then after watching it, I, w- I had a different attitude about it. I was like, "This is a tragedy. This is horrible. This is yeah. this is monstrous." Um, it's just I don't know. There's the difference between kind of that that film making it real for me. Um, anyway, yeah, I mean, I, I think that is speaking again about the importance of this moment in American history. Like it it, it happened at a time where you know we had just like we were modernizing to the point where things like a a personal camcorder film could be taken and shot and and therefore we have we have perspectives and angles on this thing for throughout history that we probably didn't have for events earlier than this right like it is a it is a modern tragedy modern being a relative phrase um and so maybe that's that's part of the reason why it's it's enraptured people so much Mm -hmm. yeah yeah that that makes sense all right, so in the next days, as the Yankees complete their historic comeback and the papers report the sudden and mysterious murder of the universally beloved Frank Dunning, um, <laughs> we, we actually never get to see Bill Turcott on this on this trip to Derry, Matt. Um, um, but, but we can't imagine he's watching people memorialize this great man and being driven absolutely insane, right? <laughs> it's, a, it's a small price to pay, uh, Bill Turcott's satisfaction, but you can just imagine how he's reacting to this whole thing. Yeah, I, I agree. He's probably very, he probably has very mixed feelings, right? Cause mm-hmm. you know, the, the guy's dead, but he didn't get to be the one who, who did it. But then again, he never would have been. So yeah. And, and to, to like a, a larger cosmic level, like I guess you could say justice was served for, for the murders, but also uh, no one will ever know Yeah, um, that, that, that he killed his first wife and, ch- and child. He'll, Right. He'll be he'll be remembered as the great man that everyone loved for the rest of eternity. Um Yeah. Just sucks a little bit. Yep. 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 So Jake gets to collect his winnings from from uh from Chaz. Three thousand dollars he won in this bet, Matt. Uh for those that are want to know, that's about thirty two and a half thousand dollars in today's money. Um 
that's a lot of money. That's a whole lot of money. Yeah. And Chaz is just like, yeah, well, you know, what are you going to do? I didn't yeah. win as much this year uh, about the World Series as I normally win. You cut into my winnings a little bit there, buddy. Um, but, you know, it's fun. I love seeing guys just come in off the streets, randomly show up in my town and and prove to me that there's still magic in the universe by making and winning this absolutely improbable bet. I love it. Uh-huh. <laughs> easy come easy go well see you later um, so did, i mean did you expect anything to come out of this in the moment or, or how, what was your feelings about the, how this plays out well so honestly Chaz, i feel he's characterized as being a very like he's one of the good ones in dairy mm-hmm. um al- although he did play a part in screwing up uh jake's attempt on the last time around it wasn't out of malice or anything he, he's clearly one of the guys who dairy has you know its foot on his neck and he's just doing his best he's not like you know what he's he's not like the pharmacist he's not one of these tools of dairy <laughs> at least that's my feeling of his characterization anyway sure um, sure so it didn't didn't shock me to see everything just kind of work out here um, okay okay cool um so all right so from here we get this a little bit. I I, I I like this. He he really feels, Jake, that he wants to go kind of check on the Dunnings and, and maybe go talk to him a little bit. But he resists the urge to do that. But I, I like this. He, he really wants to tell little Ellen Dunning that, that someday her brother Harry was going to want to put on a uniform and go for a soldier. And she must do her very, very, very best to talk him out of it. Only kids forget. Every teacher knows this. And they think they're going to live forever. Uh huh. And my reaction was, how's she going to talk him out of it? Wasn't there a little thing <laughs> called the draft? Yeah, I, I don't actually remember if if the text says whether Harry was drafted or he just voluntarily signed up to go. Um, I feel like he probably <laughs> was drafted, though. I mean, the way this is framed, it's entirely possible that he voluntarily signed up. But also, I I think that sometimes Jake indulges in a sort of wishful thinking like I, I want you to I wanted to get to this next little bit and then I'll mention how this is an example of wishful thinking sure <laughs> <laughs> um, so so Jake prepares to leave Derry uh, but before he does so he has one final task and I think this is exactly what we were talking about he leaves a note for Bill Turcott warning him about his upcoming heart issues we never find out if uh, he Bill gets this note or takes action on it but Jake trying to do a good deed, right? Yes, Jake trying to do a good deed. But, and I'm not a doctor, but <laughs> what the hell are you going to do about it? Like, it's 1958. Like, what do you, hey, hey, doc, I think maybe my ticker is bum. And then the doctor will pull out his stethoscope, <laughs> put it on your chest, and go, yep. <laughs> well, see you later. Yeah. But they didn't like, have open heart surgery in, in 1958. You couldn't like go in there and and clear out some of the plaque and the and the I heart mean, valves. The truth is that I don't know the answer to that question. But I feel like I I feel like even in the modern day, it's kind of touch and go when it comes to heart issues. Sure. So, I mean, I could be totally off base here. I I could be totally off base on both of these things, but especially in the script, them coming right after another, it's like. <laughs> He it, it sort of feels like Jake is is f- forgetting that he lives in the past where everything sucks. And the reason the boy goes to war is because he has to go to war. And the reason Bill's going to die of a heart attack is because it's 1958. And everybody dies of a heart attack in 1958. It's one of the main ways to die, which is not true anymore because our, our medicine has gotten so much better. Sure. Um, yeah. Um. So I looked this up while you were talking. 1955 was like one of the first successful open heart bypass surgery. Now they've did, open heart surgery has been a thing since like the late 1900s. Um, they okay. had successfully opened a heart, operated on it, and the patient didn't die. But like a bypass surgery, uh, the, the 50s was it was really just just starting to ramp up in the 50s. So there's a possible opportunity for Turcott to be one of the very early adopters of of bypass surgery um but also probably not yeah there's an outside chance but i wouldn't call it a certainty yeah 
Yeah. Um, so yeah, Bill's probably just gonna have a heart attack. But I mean, maybe it was maybe his heart's totally fine and it was just the stress of Jake's presence that gave him a heart attack. Maybe, yeah, maybe it was the propagation <laughs> of the time wave, who knows? <laughs> Uh, all right, Matt. So Jake leaves Derry and, and, and for, this is really interesting to your theory about how often we're going to come back and forth. Uh, we're told in this moment that Jake leaves Derry for the last time. So he will not be coming back to Derry. The, the narrator tells us. So what do you think of that? I think that's really interesting because I mean, it's possible that this is his last pass through the past. Mm-hmm. Um, and that could be why I like, like it's hard to imagine why else it would be because if he's going to, if it's not his last time through the, through the time door, then I just got to assume that he would try to fix everything in dairy again. <laughs> uh-huh. Unless he had some reason to think like that was pointless, which I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm leaning toward this. Th- this is it. But, um, but I'm not sure. I'm really not yeah. sure to be honest. It is just really interesting that I think it's completely normal to wonder how many times we're going to go do this stuff. Um, and then the book kind of tell you most likely this is it. Uh, it, it would make sense. It, mm-hmm. it would make it would make sense to me because it doesn't really feel like the, the, the this book is going to be Groundhog Daying all the way through. Like yeah, that would yeah. be that, that would be that would become strained, I think, <laughs> at, at a certain point. Sure. I, I agree with that. All right, so we move on to chapter 11. Uh, this next chapter is actually a pretty short one relatively to the, the last two, uh, but it begins with Jake feeling, I guess we'll, we'll call it a surprising amount of guilt for what he did to Frank Dunning. Uh, we get this right here. He had deserved to die. Hell needed to. But on October 5th, he had as of yet done nothing to his family, not to his second one anyway. I could tell myself and did that he'd done pr- plenty to his first one that on October 13th of 1958, he was already a murderer twice over one of his victims, little more than an infant, but I had only Bill Turcott's word for that. So I, I, I think this is really interesting because we get this moment where he commits the murder. He becomes, he kills a person, which is no easy thing to do. Maybe we, we shouldn't, we should hit that drum a little bit harder that like, regardless of whether you know the person's going to do something bad, murdering a person is a difficult thing to do i'm assuming having not done murder um Uh but everything i've read and 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 heard from people is that unless you're just a sociopath or a psychopath like it's hard to take a life um yeah he didn't really have that reaction in the moment right he just did it it was kind of it was very much in cold blood he slept like a baby the night after he did it but here at the beginning of this chapter, we're seeing how that choice is affecting him. We're seeing a little bit of the guilt that's that's riding on him a little bit here. And I think it's interesting the ways in which Jake's narration hides those emotions sometimes, but not other times. Right. Like, yeah, like he, he could have in that moment from the perspective of Jake telling the story to us talked about in the moment of the murder, how this made him feel or the guilt that he carried from this moment, or the uncertainty that he carried from this moment. It doesn't do that, though. It's very straightforward. It's a matter of fact. I shot him two times, then I shot him once more in the head just to be sure, and then I slept like a baby. Yeah. And we only come to these feelings later. Yeah. I mean, Jake has a complicated relationship with his own emotions, right? He's not a crying mm-hmm. man. Yeah. He's, he's maybe that almost by definition says that he's somebody who feels things delayed or not at all sure. relative to maybe when he, he should, um, or he finds it easy to repress his emotions, but then they come bubbling up later. Um, in most circumstances anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, yeah, I think, I think it's really interesting actually. I, you know, one thing I was thinking about is like when he, when he kills Frank, it's, it's not immediately after, you know, he's had this physical altercation with him where Frank has permanently rearranged his hairstyle with yeah, a sledgehammer. Um, but, but he, you know, he's had a few days to cool down, but he hasn't had that long to cool down really. So he's, he's, he, he is cold blooded. You're, you're right that he, he does it in a cold blooded way, but also he's like, this guy did try to kill me with it, with a sledgehammer as far as <laughs> like, yes, it's, he hasn't technically done it yet, but, I would I I can imagine being a place where you could very easily convince yourself like this guy 
literally already tried to kill me and I'm just going to put him down. And then it's only later that you start thinking through these like abstract thoughts of like, well, he, he that guy didn't actually try to kill me. It was on the other timeline. Then you start ta- you start, you start second guessing yourself later. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, he tries to do that with Chaz, right? Where he's like, he's like arguing that t- taking this guy's money in his head is like recompense for uh-huh. him him fucking him over in, in the last trip through and he was like but wait that was another lifetime um so no, he's aware of these things for sure it's a cosmic tax <laughs> um so the, the point here though is to balance out these feelings of guilt he's having jake decides that he needs to do something else he needs to save someone else and he picks uh carolyn poolin um so he's decided that he will carry forward this thing that al did um before heading on to the rest of his quest so he stops off in auburn maine and he rents a house on the lake. And I, I love this line. Those five weeks may have been the best of my life, which does not speak well uh, towards the, the rest of his life. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm always interested in like how and when and why King and other authors for that matter, break the guideline of like keeping things moving. You know, <laughs> like King King is particularly good at, at keeping a good sense of, of pacing and, and a good clip to things. Yeah. But, this, you know, this particular section of this book, it's like, and then Jake just kind of hung out for a while and it really takes its time. It's very, very meditative. Um, it gives the book kind of a different feel, actually. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. Like, just just like to step back for a second here about this, this whole sequence with uh, with Andy Cullum, like, what are, what are we doing here? Right. Like. Like, what is the narrative purpose of this? Is it just to reflect Jake's taking action to to stave off the the guilt or uncertainty he's feeling? Um, like, why are we not just moving on with the, the rest of the action of the book? And I, honestly, I don't know if I even myself know the answer to that question. Um, why we did this kind of just a temporary delay on top of the already temporary delay that we've had of moving towards the main plot of, of the novel. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think it has to do with characterization, you know, us getting to understand who this guy is. Um, and I think also there's something to be said for like exploring the different ways you can go about trying to change time by, you know, his, his plan here being quite different from the sort of action hero plan um, of murdering Frank Dunning. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I do, but I have to play coy with you, Matt. I know, I know. Um. Okay. So, so, so Jake, Jake doesn't really have a plan here, Matt. Um. <laughs> he he just decides basically he's gonna just redo all the things that Al did. Um. But on his way to do that, he stops by a store and he notices something on the wall. Andy Cullum turns out plays a mean game of cribbage. And so an idea forms in his head. And, and I like this. Coincidences, coincidences happen, but I've come to believe they are actually quite rare. Something is at work, okay? Somewhere in the universe or behind it, a great machine is ticking and turning its fabulous gears. Huh. So uh, so what's, uh, what's happening? It's, uh, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's Ludd. It's... No, it's not loud. Okay. <laughs> no, I mean it's it, there's there's the purpose and the random poking their little fingers out of the the cracks and crevices and giving him an opportunity to to change things. I mean, you it, it's funny since the past has already lost two rounds uh, against against Al. Maybe it just figures, hey, you know what? I'll give you a buy on this one. Just uh, cribbage, just do cribbage. <laughs> you don't have to spend the whole day running around. Actually. I was joking, but to take that seriously, maybe the past is like at least less disruptive. He's he, we already I already know he's going to successfully stop the guy from shooting the woman. So let's just make it less. Let's let's grant that that's going to happen, and let's make it less disruptive than the the ridiculous extents that he went to last time. Because the because you know, like I said earlier, like minimizing the rip, the ripples, damping everything down, seems to be an operating principle here. Yeah, sure. But uh, why? <laughs> like the, 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 the you're, you're right that the, the past doesn't really even try to stop this from happening, right? Like he doesn't advance it to him. Yeah. 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 He doesn't 
have any kind of the resistance we've seen in in his other efforts to change the past here nothing it it is actually just a a nice pleasant scene where he just goes to a house and plays cribbage for a few hours and then has a has a nice uh, nice conversation and a good meal and then he just goes on his way and that's it yeah i don't know <laughs> um <laughs> But why? Yeah, I mean, I have so many questions for this that we can't get into. But um, it, I, I think the cool thing is w- it, these questions are constantly being posed to us. I think. Yeah, yeah, and and, I, and they're all in the back of my mind. And as as new things come up, they'll be triggered, and we can come back and talk about it. Mm-hmm. I really love this part as well, and I think this might get to the, your question and, and and actually my question and, and your answer about like why we're doing this scene. It says, they were nice people, the Cullums, a nice couple with a nice baby. I thought of them sometimes when I heard Lee and Marina Oswald screaming at each other in their low-end apartments, or saw them, on at least one occasion, carrying their animus out onto the streets. The past harmonizes. It also tries to balance, and mostly succeeds. The Cullums were at one end of the seesaw, the Oswalds were at the other, and Jake Epping, also known as George Amberson, he was the tipping point. So I, I think, like, it's almost as if we're in this liminal state before moving to the next phase of the novel and King is not just quite ready for that yet. And so we yeah. just need to have, here's this moment of goodness here. That I, I like that. I mean, again, speaking, uh, uh, doyalistically, it's like the, the book is at risk of becoming a miserable slog. If you just mm-hmm. jump from the shithole of dairy to like, now let's hang out with, Lee Harvey Oswald beating his wife. It's like, it's kind of good to space these things out actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. That makes sense. The other thing I like about this is, is something that we haven't thought about yet, or at least the text never really comes right out and says it like this. The focus of this mission has always been to save Carolyn Poulin. They, when, when Al was trying to do it, uh, when, um, when uh, Jake accidentally undid it, it's always been about her and her experiences and what happens to her. But, Andy Cullum was just kind of forgotten in that as a, as a guy who like he didn't do anything wrong. Right. I mean, it it was an accident. It was just a freak accident that he fired a gun and it happened to, to find this girl as if it was searching for her. Um, And so one of the things he's also doing is taking away this life changing experience of I'm responsible for paralyzing a, a, a child. Um, with my recklessness, yeah. this is, this seems like a good man who didn't do anything intentionally wrong and had to live with the guilt and repercussions of that act, that accident his entire life as well. And he's not really been the focus of, of the, the, the saving, but I think getting to, to see him and hang out with him and see his family here brings that, I think, to the forefront of our minds that he's not just saving Carolyn, he's saving Andy too. Absolutely. Yeah. And this guy seems like a really good guy who would have taken it very hard as well. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's funny. I, I distinctly remember the first time we read about this accidental shooting of the girl. Like, you know, I, I was thinking like, wow, what a horrible situation. You've got, you know, this father who is just going for this for the, for a walk with his child and his child is, is senselessly maimed in this way. Obviously, the, the child herself is horribly, you know, life changingly injured. And then Mm -hmm. you've got this man who fired a shot. He just went out to have a nice hunt and, and now he has this guilt for the rest of his life. So like there's, there's, you know, three lives are damaged, not just hers. And, um, and I'm kind of, so I'm like sort of, sort of glad that we got back to this and we actually inspected that angle of things. Um, I agree. The more I think about it, the more kind of necessary the sequence feels to me that we just, we needed this. mm -hmm. Uh, Just, just to, just to draw the connection, I mean, it's it's a it's a gun, it's a rifle shooting a mm. person, right? Sure. We've, we're, yeah. we're we're drawing. In in this case, the guy is you know an an innocent who did it accidentally, um, and the victim was not killed. Like there are obviously dissimilarities, but it's it's a it's a sort of visual motif, you could say. Sure. Yeah, I like that. Um, I also just wanted to point this out for for our, our fun dark tower connections um as he's learning about cribbage he learns about what andy called the mystic 19 the so-called impossible hand again i don't know cribbage at all uh-huh. so i'm assuming that's actual thing <laughs> yeah it could just be totally made up that's true it's funny when you just search mystic 19 in google 
it just the Stephen King wiki comes up. <laughs> this is not like it's not like this is a, a extremely common. That's hilarious. Uh, cribbage thing. Yeah. Are they are they battening down for the Alice that's going to blow in um, after they're done playing? <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a little Doom key reference for y'all. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just I'm just trying to find out what they call this. I mean, I guess it's just 19 is just a really impossible, extremely unlikely hand to get in cribbage. Okay. Um, I believe you. Okay. Score breakdown, assuming random discards to crib. 19 has percentage of hands, 0%. Okay. Yeah, it's just, the, it looks like it's just like the least likely score gotcha. to happen. It's like, so it's mystic. Yeah, whatever. But we got to point, point it is, out. Yeah. The point is, King's having fun. Yeah. yeah. I love it. So at the end of the day, as Jake prepares to leave, Cullum's wife actually takes him aside and, and asks basically bluntly, what did you just save him from? Uh, when Jake won't say, tell, she says, that's fine. Um, but but that she prayed to God and, and God told her that's why Jake was here. She calls him Gandhi's guardian angel, the second person that's called him that recently, and, and thanks him for for what was done here. So obviously something gave um, this woman an answer as to why Jake was here, uh, whether it's literal God or something else, who knows, but yeah. uh, another, another like heartwarming scene, right? Where yeah. you know, these people are just so nice. I agree. I mean, it's beautiful. I mean, it, it, based on the last three or four books we've read, I'm ready to believe that this is, you know, God or Gan or whatever, just, mm-hmm giving her a break to yeah. tell her the truth. Um, she seems like a good person. Why not? Um, but um, I mean, it, it's interesting. Like they, they put up some token resistance to his helping. Right. But, but yeah, well, cause it's a really weird, it's a really weird yeah. request. <laughs> like it's like, Hey, I'll pay you $500 to teach me cribbage on yeah. a specific day, two weeks from now. <laughs> And, and and yeah, like if somebody tried that with me, I would be like, I I don't I don't see the angle here, <laughs> but I know this is a scam. Yeah, I'm just I'm just too slow to 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 figure out what it is. Get the hell out of my house, you know. But yeah, um, but they need the money, right? So mm-hmm. um, yeah, so that's what that kind of forces them into it that they desperately need that money, and so um, they they do it but yeah it's a very very weird situation he's created here i was also thinking a possible reason why ka was not you know able to stop him is simply that the attack vector is so oblique and elliptical and it, it's not you know racing to to intercept the guy right it's like i am gonna i want you to play cribbage with me <laughs> it's, it's just very mm-hmm. it's very un, it's a very unusual approach yeah. and um Maybe, maybe if you take a sort of an indirect approach, then the universe has a harder time figuring out how to stop you. Um, I, I don't know. Just I like that. I like that. All right. So that's the end of our chapter, Matt. Uh, Jake, Jake leaves Maine and heads south. Uh, the chapter ends as he gets down to the west coast of Florida. Why is he there? What are you doing, Jake? I, I don't know. <laughs> She's supposed to go to... Is this like when Stephen King uh, had a New York couple uh, drive to Disney World and stop in Oklahoma? Is uh-huh. this, does he just not know what the country looks like? I think uh, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> it's the South, Scott. It's the South. Yeah, you just go south. It's all there. No, I'm yeah. sure we will find out what Jake is doing in Florida next week. Um, but that's that's going to do it for the chapters this week. Uh, we'll be reading chapters uh, 12 and 13 in next week's reading uh, as we continue with part two, three living in the past. Sounds good. All right, Matt, it's discussion question time. We had a, we had a toughie. We had a toughie for people last week, uh, but we still got a fair amount of responses though. I think, you know, uh, the question was uh, the past is obdurate, but it's not the only thing. What are some other things you'd describe as obdurate in Stephen King's works or elsewhere? Baby King You Dig Your Sam says, Roland DeShane is the apotheosis of obdurate. No one will stand between him and his tower. He's willing to do whatever it takes and to sacrifice anyone around him to reach the tower. And that's why his Ka is a wheel. I like it. Yep. It's good stuff. I agree. I think good old uh, 
face chiseled from obdurate granite. <laughs> He's um that's kind of his it's kind of like the motif of of Roland as a character is like the character who you desperately want to see progress in his arc and he kind of does and then he goes back and then he kind of does and then he goes back again. Yeah. And that's yeah, obdurate. Mm-hmm. All right, Sleeping Cat Lady says, I feel like this adjective applies to a great many Stephen King characters, and in many cases leads to that character's downfall, and often the downfall of others. Margaret White is obdurate. Chris Harginson and Billy Nolan are obdurate. Father slash pair Callahan is obdurate to an extent, although can usually admit when he's made a mistake. Roland Deschain is certainly obdurate, but likewise has the ability to admit and learn from his mistakes. At least sometimes. Jack Torrance is obdurate. Bert from the short story Children of the Corn is obdurate and has enough time to bitterly regret it. I could probably go through every King book and find one or more examples of obdurate characters, but I'll stop there. I also feel that many places in King's works could be described as obdurate, namely the Overlook Hotel, Derry, Maine, and especially the Micmac Burial Ground in Pet Cemetery. Honestly, I almost feel like that these places in particular are characters in their own right. They are all pieces of land that either started out bad for an unknown reason or soured over time due to supernatural influence. They have the ability to manipulate people and events to get their outcome they want, usually a bad one, and are truthfully even more sinister than the other obdurate characters in Stephen King books because they can't be reasoned with or truly destroyed with the human or some of the supernatural obdurate characters there's at least a slim chance they could be talked out of their plans or prevented from carrying them out with the obdurate places there's no chance at all that's really interesting yeah i love the idea of those like uh, describing dairy main as obdurate i think is perfect actually yeah i'm also thinking i mean we just watched the castle rock tv show which is not Mm -hmm. you know technically Stephen King but I, that that the town of Castle Rock in that show felt very very much in line with this I love that yeah that's a cool observation uh Steve Livingroom says unmoved by persuasion pity or tender feelings stubborn unyielding um I believe that's the definition of the word pretty much every king antagonist is obdurate in their beliefs and that's what usually brings their downfall but the only answer to this question in this group is Ka Ka is obdurate. It doesn't care about your feelings, wants, or beliefs. Ka will do as Ka wills. You can whine and complain and fight it every step of the way, but Ka will have its way. I, I agree. Guess. Yeah, yeah. I, I um, I still don't understand Ka, but uh, but yeah, you're right. <laughs> we never will. That's the point. I think. Yep. Yep. Uh, TN Bug Doc says, my favorite obdurate character is a recalcitrant detective that just refuses to budge on pretty much anything, whether it's being be in combat with vault robbing hostage taker takers, Albert, airport hijackers or New York spree bombers. He's always dogged in his pursuit of justice. Not even his sharp tongued executive ex-wife can manage to wrangle him. He just flat out refuses to die. I speak of none other than John McClane, the Uber cop protagonist in the hands down best Christmas movie of all time. Yippee ki yay. I don't know if you recognized it in my voice when I realized halfway through <laughs> reading this who we were talking about and was delighted. Uh, but, that's great. Yeah. Yeah, I, I read these in advance, so I, I was looking <laughs> forward to this one. Yeah. I I think that's great. Yeah, that's... um. I mean, I think a lot of action movie protagonists have this quality of like the more beat up they get, the the happier we are. <laughs> and, that, <laughs> and, and they're, they're, yes, they're very obdurate. Yeah. Uh, WB Custom Cookies says, Obdurate is such a great word. The painting American Gothic by Grant Wood should be used in the dictionary under Obdurate. This painting leads me to my favorite Obdurate characters, Wilfred and Arlette James from the novella 1922. (laughs) Wilfred (laughs) wants to keep his farm. It's really the only thing he is immovable about. His wife, Arlette, wants to sell the farm and move to the big city. She is forced to be. She is a force to be reckoned with. Neither of them are willing to compromise, and chaos ensues. This story should be read al- aloud in marriage classes as a cautionary tale. Adapt or die, people, or get eaten alive by rats. Oh man, what a fun movie! Uh, so obviously, yes. Uh, WB Custom Cookies is talking about the novel, the novella. Uh, mm-hmm. We we talked about the film adaptation starring Thomas Jane over on our Patreon only podcast. Uh, that's such a good movie. I I yeah. still think about that movie sometimes. I I agree. I loved it so much. I I got to see that at Fantastic Fest at its premiere, and it's a, it was a great fest movie that just like 
so fun to watch with the crowd. But yeah, it even holds up when I watched it at home. Great movie. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All right. Uh, Electrical Hummus says, I've got a weird one. Hear me out. The forest in The Girl Who Loved Tom Gordon is obdurate. Poor Trisha just needs to take a pee while on a hike with her family and ends up hopelessly lost in the New England wilderness. The forest is merciless and simply does not let up on her for a minute. The bugs, the swamps, the darkness, the something in the woods, everything is seeming to work against this poor girl. I'd highly recommend this book for Matt. It hits you so hard when you have a daughter. I read it while I was in labor with my daughter through <laughs> and through the first few weeks of her life, and it definitely holds a special place in my heart great you know my wife was in labor two times Uh and i don't think she'd be able to read a book either of those times so kudos yeah kudos for labor reading committed the truly the constant reader (laughs) (laughs) now i i really love uh the girl who loves tom gordon i've seen a lot of like negative reviews of that book that describe it as as boring um just it's not very long at all and it's fascinating to me i i agree i agree that you would you would like this story cool i will read it uh dj nadelko says i believe jack torrance and his alcoholism fall into the obdurate definition king does such a good job of making us really hope that jack can turn things around he loves danny and it breaks our hearts when things really take a turn for the worse at times, when we catch glimpses of his love for Dan- Danny, it's almost frustrating when he can't let go of everything else and just love his family. I find the frustration piece one theme that links The Shining to 11.22.63. Not that I'm frustrated with King's writing, rather just the situation itself. Um, numerous times, Jack thinks back to his past and focuses on one event that changed the course of his life. And not, and not that Another theme to 11.22.63. These memories stick with him and almost set themselves up as barriers to his ability to get over his alcoholism. There are a few more things I'd like to say, but won't spoil anything for 11-22-63. Perhaps we can just blame Ka in the end, though, as the Overlook itself was always working against him. And did any of us really think he would be able to pull through? (laughs) Nope. Yeah, it's funny. to. it's, It's a funny question, though, because obviously not, because I've always been aware of the plot of The Shining for my entire life. Sure. But maybe if I had just read the book in a vacuum, maybe I would have thought, hey, there's a chance this could end happily. I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's tough to know, right? But yeah. I, I feel like when we read that book, a close reading, <laughs> that it, it, no, this is the way it was always going to yeah. go. I, I think you're, you're right. I, I just tend to be kind of a, a sentimental sap who, who just <laughs> will, will hope until there's no more hope um, that the character can turn things around. Yeah. Uh, poor Jack. Yep. All right. Other worlds. 1999 says Roland is definitely an obvious choice for obdurate character, but I'm going to go with Detta Walker. She had no purpose, but to thwart that mofo Roland and would do anything, including slamming on the brakes to her wheelchair, throwing herself onto the ground or refusing to eat. As long as it caused Roland grief, she literally did not want to be moved. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a great answer. Uh, I think when I started reason, I was uh, reading and I was like, oh, but Detta becomes so much more complicated than that. But I think I think it's it's clear that other worlds meant at least Detta in her her initial appearance in drawing of the three. I think I it's certainly obdurate. Uh huh. <laughs> I agree. Uh, BC Johnson says, as the resident, let's talk about Buffy guy. I feel like Sunnydale as a town is obdurate about its veneer of normality. The strange elements of Sunnydale are always there. Zombies, hyena people, Snyder. But everyone from the background characters to Buffy's mom seem committed to missing the signs. As Buffy puts it, how many times have you washed blood out of my clothing and you still haven't figured it out? It's one thing to to not believe in vampires the first time you see one. It's another for 400 people to see a huge demon at a very public event and to not move away the very next day or even acknowledge that it happened. The supernatural becomes more obvious with each passing season, but you always find the bronze full the next day, no matter the latest high body count disaster. The very nature of the hellmouth may be to blame, or maybe it's just how people are when faced with the horror they don't want to engage with. Um, They also say, they say, my wife chimed in with uh, Stars Hollow from Gilmore Girls having a similar reversion to kooky rejection of progress. Um, rejection of progress obduracy um (laughs) i always find it fun when you you end up having to 
accidentally or like not not through any intention of either of us be the one that reads the Buffy ones. <laughs> and I just yes. know you're like, I don't know what any of this means. And I'm over here just nodding my head like, yep, right. yep, yep. Yeah. You, you hear me read what is obviously an inside joke that I don't understand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Zombies, hyena people, Snyder. Yep. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's like. a direct quote from one of the episodes. Yeah. Uh, great answer. I, I, I love like how many of these answers are places rather than than people. Um, I think that's an interesting observation that I hadn't considered, but I think it is absolutely true. Some places are just just obdurate. Yeah, I mean, they have to burn Salem's Lot to the ground and they still don't even succeed in killing the evil there. Yeah. Uh, last but not least, we have Salty Interview 3006. I love these names. I agree wholeheartedly with a couple answers here already. Roland DeShane will forever be my favorite and Trish McFarlane's obduracy in The Girl Who Loved Tom Gordon saved her life and made her a character that is easy to love. I'm currently reading the screenplay of Storm of the Century and I don't think the obduracy of of Andre Linoge, at least in the first three acts that I've read so far, can be understated. Similar to Roland, he has no qualms about who or what dies to get his point across. I'm excited to keep reading. I never have gotten to watch the movie, so this is the next best thing. Oh, huh, we did an episode on uh, Storm of the Century. We did. I remember I remember Linoge well. Yep. He I think Obdurate is certainly fair description of, of his role in that, that story, that's for sure. Yeah. That's a you know, there, we had a lot of things to say about that movie. Um, not all of them positive. Not all of them positive, but I do remember distinctly feeling like it uh, uh, earned a place in my memory, <laughs> for sure. Without spoiling <laughs> anything for the question uh, answerer here, um, the, where that story is willing to go at the end of it is one of my favorite things ever, because yeah. I just never expected it um i'm yeah. mixed on the thing as a whole but man that's a great ending yeah i mean ma- mainly i just felt like it could have been an hour shorter easily but yes yeah. i agree that yeah. the ending is fantastic mm-hmm. all right uh thank you everyone for sending those answers in lots of good ones for that I'm, I'm happy with that i was a little worried about this discussion question i think i think this next one's going to be a little bit easier on you folks all right Matt, uh, what so is ne- the what is the question Next week's discussion question is, what is your favorite bet, sports or otherwise, in fiction or in real life? Yeah. Once again, we're being intentionally loose here with with definitions. Define this as any way you want. But obviously, this is in honor of our incredibly reckless World Series bet. That's right. And there sure are a lot of these in fiction. <laughs> betting, betting is fun. Betting is a fun thing to do in your story. So. Yeah. Easy way of creating tension. Mm-hmm. All right. That is it for us this week. Next week, 11, 22, 63, we'll continue with our fifth episode as we cover chapters 12 and 13 of the book. Matt, I can't believe we've been doing this book for a month already. It really just flies by, doesn't it? It does. I, I'm surprised to hear that, but you're totally right. Yeah. This is this is episode four. We just recorded here. Awesome. Well, anyway, remember you can reach us via email at kingslingerspod at gmail.com or over on Twitter at kingslingerspod or over on the subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash doofmedia. That's a great place to answer the discussion question or just hang out. Yeah, and if you want to buy some sweet merch, you can do so over at our Shopify store. That's doofmedia.com slash myshopify.com where a bunch of, you know, the merch. There's the shirts, the mugs, the hoodies, the stickers, all that cool stuff it's all there for you i'm sure we'll have the propagation of the time wave uh mug in there any any day now (laughs) um i i I want it i really want it i don't know what it would look like i I don't know we got to do something fun with that design yeah i i i I saw somebody made that comment and i was like yes that is a good idea as if like someone other than me would have to be the one to take action on that (laughs) Um, so yeah, that's, um, that's step one is acknowledging that the idea is good. That's true. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, yes, the cool stuff over there. And, um, also we would really appreciate it if you could, um, head on over to patreon.com slash doof media. Um, and, um, you, you can, uh, listen to, uh, any of the, uh, uh Stephen King adaptation uh, episodes that we have, done um including uh, 1922 and storm of the century um and many others 
Yeah. Oh, there's there's so much over there if you've never checked it out. Uh, tons of hours and hours. I know you don't get enough of our two and a half to three hour episodes each week, so there's hours more of us. Hooray. Yep. Right. <laughs> of course, if you cannot afford that right now, that is absolutely okay. You can t- continue to do what I know you're already doing, which is sharing this podcast with friends, family, uh, obdurate towns, all that stuff. Um, <laughs> you can also help us out by leaving a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or uh, any anywhere else that can do reviews. Um, I'm blanking audible audible does reviews, right? Yeah. Uh, this week's review comes from a user named random characters who says my favorite level of the tower. I kept reading about this podcast on Reddit, but was skeptical at first. Do I really need to read along with other people? And the first time I heard about it, I just finished a reread. Why start again? I was so wrong. Going through again with Scott and Matt made this umpteenth journey to the tower far more satisfying than ever before. My only wish is that I had jumped on the wagon back in 20 so I could have joined in the discussions. I finished season one a month or so ago and waited until 11.22.63 to jump back in just so I can join in. If you want to feel like you're discussing this book with your best friends like I did when the final three came out, sadly we've drifted in the intervening decades. So unless you're lucky enough to have to belong to a group of tower junkies like i did 20 years ago this is the best chance you're having going to get that feeling you can only say what it is in french Uh, (laughs) that's a stephen king short story by the way (laughs) that's great well once again i'm like why is why is every single person who writes a review just like a really good writer (laughs) i know and i did a really bad job reading that but that was uh it was very well well written and okay. very nice. Our, our our eyes aren't working very well today. It's not our fault. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, thank you so much, random character and other random characters that re- leave these rating and reviews. We we really do appreciate that. Thanks for the kind words. Please keep them coming. And that's going to do it for us this week. We'll be back next week with more eleven twenty two sixty three. Maybe just maybe uh, Jake will get to Dallas. Um, are there going to be any uh, dinosaurs on this <laughs> dinosaur tour? Uh, hello? <laughs> hello? <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks. Long days and pleasant night. And may you have twice the number. Twice the number.